Now that so many of us are working from home, how has our new normal affected teaching, continuing education, and our overall screen time habits? Dr. Seema Nando will be joining us today to discuss just that. Dr. Nanda? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. <laughs> Good morning. This morning we're going to be talking with Dr. Seema Nanda of the Nanda Dry Eye Institute in Houston, Texas. Dr. Nanda is also a clinical professor at the University of Houston. Dr. Nanda, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Thomas. I'm so excited to be part of OcuTalk. What a great way to uh, introduce uh, a lot of new doctors in the, well, not even new, some very expert opinions on some different topics. So thank you so much. Uh, yes, I am uh, the creator or the CEO or whatever you want to call it, the president of the Nanda Dry Eye Institute, which I started just this last year uh, after working over a decade with a well-renowned corneal specialist here in Houston who decided to retire on me. So having said that, I thought, well, I learned a whole lot of different things from him and I wanted to expound on that with my own clinic and it, it's been really great. Uh, despite the little downturn that we've had, but things are cr uh, crawling back up again, so I'm excited about that. I'm also a professor, a clinical adjunct clinical professor at the University of Houston. I've been that way over a decade as well. I had students rotating through my clinic as well as me teaching on the campus, although that's changed a bit too, so thank you. Well, we're certainly happy to have you here today. A second ago, you mentioned about being an adjunct professor at the University of Houston. So can you talk a little bit about what, what that means for some of our viewers? Oh, sure. Yeah. So what that means is like, I am, uh, so what happened was several years ago when I'd started, uh, I didn't want to give up teaching and teaching is sometimes you become a better doctor if you teach it because it's amazing how many questions students ask you and you're like, oh, I used to know that. Uh, maybe I should, you know, go back and learn a little bit too. So when you learn and teach, it's like, see one, do one, teach one. That's kind of how I feel. Well, when I started working with the corneal specialist, I said, well, I can't work here five days a week. I still want to teach. So uh, it's a part-time position. It's not a tenure track or anything like that. So I still get to teach in the clinic while being part of this uh, ophthalmology group that I was in. And when he was in surgery, I was teaching. When he wasn't, we were working together hand by hand or side by side or whatever you call it. So it was kind of like that. And what does that mean? Well, just like this background I have here, which is virtual, but like everything is these days, uh, I would be in the clinic with the students, the students would see the patients and then they'd come back to me and say, I saw this, this, this. Uh, what are the next steps that I need to do in order to get this patient seeing better or do they need some kind of glaucoma treatment or cataract surgery? So the students would see the patients first and then I would come in behind them and verify their work, verify their findings, and then we'd make a plan together uh, to assess what the patient needs and um, do that accordingly. So yeah, that's what it means by being an adjunct. Also, being adjunct as well, is that I have students in my clinic right now. So what they would do is they would see the patients kind of the same way, or they, if it was too complicated, like they've never seen a corneal transplant, I do treat a lot of those or um, manage a lot of those patients. So they'll come in there and I'm like, oh, Dr. Nanda, I think I see a stitch loose. Oh, okay, well, what are we gonna do with that? Or what are, and they'd be like, I, I don't know, I've never seen a transplant before. So we work together in the clinic. They see the cases, I see the cases together. And then again, in my own office or on the campus of the University of Houston. It's pretty cool. So when, when you're talking with the students, uh, so this is kind of after the fact, so they, they've seen a patient and then they, they've got some questions and then they come to you with these questions. Are, uh, so what is that process like? Do they then take that information and then they're going back and, and treating, uh, treating these patients or is this something that they've already dealt with? 50-50. Uh, so sometimes they've seen cases and they're very astute at it and they know what to do. Um, like when they're a third or fourth year, but when they're in the second year clinic, it's all new to them. So when they go into that, that's probably their first patient they've seen. They've, they've examined each other in the classroom. They've examined their friends. They even, you know, get a retina scope and they're examining their dog or their cat if the cat will sit still, if you know what I mean. But they're doing it a lot of different things, but they're not doing it on, let's say, real patients. So when they're in a second year, they might not know what to do. So they're constantly coming back and going, okay, I saw this. Um, 
plus 10 hyperope and I don't know what that means. Do I give them the plus 10 or do I not? And so you have to kind of go through these steps where what did you learn in school? What did you learn in the notes versus what you see in the real practice? Because just because you see it doesn't mean that you treat it full scope. In other words, you can't give somebody a plus 10 all of a sudden. It's too much for them to take. So you slowly get into that prescription and then the patient comes back in three to six months and then you reassess and reassess and reassess until they're able to take that full. Otherwise, they won't be able to accommodate or focus through that. That's the art of treating a patient, not the science of it. What we learn in a book does not necessarily translate into the real world. So getting that clinical practice from a second year to the third year. In third year, they get a little bit better because they know now, oh yeah, I don't, I don't put all these antibiotics just because I, I learned about it in school. I don't put 16 different antibiotics on one patient. I pick the one that's more broad spectrum to treat that case. And then I'll go, oh yeah, I know. Now it's less toxic for the cornea. The patients heal faster, et cetera. And by the time they're a fourth year, they're almost ready to get on the real world. And they know, oh yeah, I've seen these cases. I've done it my second year, my third year, my fourth year. Now my clinical attending, which would be me, would say, I, I would tell the clinical attending, this is what I wanna do, this, this, this. And then I would say, thumbs up, you got it. Or, hey, let's back off a little bit. Maybe we shouldn't do all these different steps. So it's kind of what level they're at. And then when they're ready to go out in the real world, they're still practicing. Guess what? You don't go out into a, a, a perfect, you go out into a practice. So when we go out into practice, we're still practicing the arts and the crafts that we've learned throughout school. And we just keep seeing more and more patients and getting better and better and better at it. I would imagine that as, as the years have gone on, so, sort of what you're talking about in clinic has changed as procedures change and other things. Uh, so what would you say right now is, is maybe something that you're seeing more in clinic uh, now than you have in the past? I think because unfortunately we are being zoomed to death. It's a great modality for communicating with our friends and family. It's become a new way of learning because they can't, well, they haven't been able to see patients for the last five months. And because of that, they're on the computer a lot. And when they're on the computer a lot, guess what? They don't blink as much. And when they don't blink as much, there's a problem there too and their eyes get dry. And when they get dry, then they get, you know, their eyes are hurting. And I personally have been affected by this because I have been doing a lot of lectures, uh, which brings me to another topic, which I can talk about a little bit. But I do a lot of lectures online now because it can't be in the real human world. I want, I want touching people. I want to be with people again. Hopefully we'll get there soon. But the students and the, and the patients and everything, they're, they're learning to deal with the dry eyes more than they ever had to before. And I know this, I think this topic may sometimes be underdiagnosed just because we wanna get the person out of the chair. Um, but it's real, it's really a problem now. And it's not just something, okay, give some lubricating drops and you're done. You have to assess which layer of the tear film it is. And there's three tear layers, which I'm, sure some of your audience may know about the top tier layers which is the lipid layer and that's the front coating and that comes from these glands right here behind the eyelashes and that lipid layer produces that tear film that keeps all the other tears in place kind of like braces and if the that tear layer is evaporating because you're not blinking as much then the aqueous or the second layer so the top layer is lipid the second layer is the aqueous layer that aqueous layer starts to flood and you're like my eyes keep watering well they're dry Come and say, what? They're not dry. They're watering. Did you not hear me? Yes, we understand. So what can you fix that with, with the top layers disappearing? One of the best products I've ever seen on the market to help that is like retain MGD. MGD stands for meibomian gland dysfunction or meibomian gland dystrophy or meibomian gland disease. That's the layer. The meibomian glands is that layer that produces that li lid, uh, top lipid layer. If that's disappearing, what better way to retain that tear is then to use a retain type product. So retain MGD is like my go-to uh, tear product. I tell the patient to use it once in the morning, once in the evening to provide that coating on that surface that's disappearing. So the other problem is you have the lipid layer and the mucin layer and sandwiched between that is the aqueous layer. So like I said, it was flooding before. Well, sometimes it doesn't flood, it doesn't produce. And that's produced right here behind the eye, right here in the lacrimal gland. And the lacrimal gland spits out its juices, which is the aqueous layer. Sometimes that deteriorates over time. So you need to have a lubricant to you know replenish that tear. One of the 
the nicer ones out there is Refresh. Refresh has a lubricant that comes out, which is really great. Another one is uh, HPMC, which is retained product as well. And that is a little bit thicker than the Refresh. And when you, it's a little pump and then you just pump it on the eye, pump it on the eye, and it kind of coats that to your layer that's been evaporating as we've been staring at the computer. So those are my two favorites, I guess, or three favorites that I would like to put on patients that are sitting in front of the computer, zooming out on everything, Netflixing themselves to death, watching everything on Disney Plus. I probably advertise for all these different companies. I didn't mean to. I'm just saying that we've just found a new way to communicate via the evil TV, I call it the computer, or watching a lot of movies and things and just not blinking. Yeah, absolutely. I, and that's something that's been talked about on this channel uh, very often. Is that, As a matter of fact, I don't think I've had a single conversation with a doctor yet where we haven't talked about the, the this new paradigm of people not blinking from watching screens all day and the, and the dry eye problems that can come along with that. So another thing that you had mentioned, uh, Dr. Nanda, was uh, uh, about lecturing. And I, I know that you do a lot of lecturing. So can you walk me through, like, what, what exactly does that mean? I mean, certainly us in the industry, we know what lecturing means. But uh, for, for those of our viewers who don't know what that means, could you give us a little background on, on what you do as far as lecturing and what that's about? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I would love to talk a little bit more about that. Now, when you hear about lecturing, when you go on, so uh, being a professor, being a teacher, being, you know, teaching in the clinic, uh, seeing my patients and everything, sometimes you think, okay, you're lecturing them. Don't forget to take your glaucoma meds or whatever. That's not exactly what we're talking about. But on that same note, it's kind of like teaching uh, on a wide scale. So think about it. When we go to our continuing education courses, we sit there in a big hotel room, um, in an auditorium, everything, I get on the podium and I start talking about the latest and greatest in ocular medicine, um, the news treatments for different conditions and everything like that. But we're not being able to do that anymore. And hopefully we will coming the first of next year. I'm crossing my fingers again. Um, what we've been doing instead is lecturing online or giving our continuing education courses online. And I had been doing that for a little bit, but not to the extent that we have now. So in March, I was supposed to go uh, fly out to Dallas to speak at a, you know, their national conference and that got canceled. And I was actually flying back from Oklahoma giving their course. And on the plane back, I kept thinking, what's going to be happening in the next few months? Am I going to be continuing to teach? And so I decided to create my own uh, online series, which I've been doing since March. And I've done about 30 online courses now, which is a lot considering it's only been, what, four or five months. So every week I would, uh, I had these courses that I would give live, but instead of giving it live, I would do these Zoom courses where 100 doctors or so would sign up for the course. And then I would start talking about whatever the topic would be. So. But instead of making it like your same humdrum lecture that you'd go on, I decided, even though my courses are kind of entertaining anyway, because that's just my personality, I created a new way of doing it. So I call it edutainment. So it's not only educational, but it's entertaining. And what I mean by that, I actually get into the character. So one of my lectures is... Harry Potter and the Secret Chamber of Dry Eye Spells. And we go over different things what uh, we would use in clinic to diagnose dry eye disease. And there's so many different things from speed question, OSDI, the DEQ5. That's just one thing, just a subjective way of saying, how is your eyes dry? Then we go into different things like uh, uh, MMP9 testing, osmolarity testing, um, all these different subjects just to say what and then once we have that, once we figure out, is it an aqueous deficiency or lipid deficiency or mucin deficiency or whatever it is, then we have testing or treatments for those. So depending on the type, and then we go into different thermal treatments, the newest thermal treatments, Akisoft has one, thermal one touch, Lipoflow. These are different type of treatment options that we can once we've identified the problem. So that's just one example. Another example is um, Avengers corneal endgame. And if I, might do this just to let you know what I mean by edutainment. I'm just going to show you real quick what I mean by that. So if I look here, look, I changed my background. So now I'm in Asgard, which is a home of Thor. So I'll come out there and I'll dress up as Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy and I'll start telling the uh, Avengers have this end game trying to figure out what the corneal disease. Um, 
it's just kind of fun. So I, it's becoming more entertaining as I do that. Well, and, 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 you know, just real quick, uh, real quickly, I think for, for our group that's watching this show, maybe not everybody understands what continuing education is in general. Can you talk a little bit about what continuing education is and the requirements for uh, optometrists to take continuing education? Absolutely, Thomas. That's that's a great question. So if you think about it, when you graduate from school and you're like, woohoo, there's my diploma, I'm out of here, bye. There's new develops that happen. It just doesn't stop when you graduate. So when you graduate, you're like, I'm done learning. Not exactly. So every year, each state requires their doctors, whether, and it doesn't even matter doctor, doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever the profession is, they require you to keep up with the upcoming latest and greatest technologies, treatments, um, new laws, whatever that's happening in your state. And it's up to us, the educators, to make sure that the doctors out there are up to par with the newest, latest, greatest things. So when they require these things, they require certain many hours to be continuing education hours, which are either medicine oriented, um, disease oriented, uh, new treatments for whatever, glaucoma things, new laws that get passed in in your state, in our state in Texas, we have laws that get changed every so many years and they say, oh, we can now treat this thing. So if we can treat glaucoma now, then we want to make sure that the doctors are up to speed with the new um, diagnostic tools and equipment. Sometimes it's that, just there's a new visual field or there's a new way of testing, new dry eye testing, things of that nature that they might not get. Sometimes they'll get the journals in their uh, mailbox and sometimes they'll read it or not. But even if they read it or don't, they're not really required to understand it unless they, of course, take a test. Well, the test is what? Sitting through the course and understanding the newest thing and then incorporating that knowledge into their practice models because those patients are going to go to those doctors who are doing the latest and greatest in medicine so, or in anything in the profession. So it's just keeping, continuing their education so that they know what's the newest thing out there in their field. That's what continuing education is. And it's my job to make sure they know it. So I have to read. I have to study. I have to read all the journals and things. I have to sift through all these different things to create that course. So they're not only getting the newest thing, but they're getting it in an entertaining way so that they can remember it. Because sometimes once they take the course, it's just like in one ear and out the other. My thing is to keep it in the ear and then keep it in the brain. So when they're out in practice, like, oh, yeah, I remember Dr. Nanda talked about this. I'm going to go back and look at it again because I remember it because she said it in a, such a funny way that I'm going to keep it in my brain so I can know, treat my next patient with it. And it's, and I don't even mind after the class, I give out my email and I say, and again, they can find me on Instagram, like, Hey, Dr. Nanda, I learned this in your course. And I just don't, I have this patient that's complicated and I'm not sure what to do with it. And they reach out to me and I'm like, sure, this is what I would, I, I would think based on what you're telling me, this is what I would do. And you know, let me know how it goes. And they're like, oh yeah, it went great. Or no, it went down. What do I do next? Well, let's try this option or that option or whatever. So it's, it's continuing their knowledge and making sure until they stop practicing. And even when they stop practicing, I have doctors who are retired and they still like taking the courses because they want to keep up. They just want to know what's out there. Even if they're not doing it, they want to know what's the, the latest stuff out there. Well, that's good information. I certainly, uh, any optometrist, ophthalmologist, you know, any doctor in general will understand what CE is, but uh, I think sometimes on these channels, we, we use some, some jargon. It's good to explain uh, exactly what that means and for people to appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, the, the doctors that are out here that are, that are working on you on a daily basis are continually being updated so that they, they're always uh, up to speed on the latest and greatest. Exactly. Exactly right. Well, Dr. Nanda, we've had a good talk this morning, and we got to talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to be an adjunct professor. We talked a little bit about lecturing, and, and certainly in terms of your CE courses, we will, uh, if, if you'll allow us, we'll put a link to that in our description here. Uh, and, uh, but outside of that, thank you very much for being with us, and is there anything you want to leave everybody with as we part? Well, I'm just so excited. Thank you again for allowing me to share my two cents of wisdom or whatever <laughs> entertainment with you guys. And... Um, Again, starting a practice is daunting. It's scary in this new world, but it's exciting. It's super exciting. It's super exciting to come out. I mean, I know everyone's like, oh, these graduating class are so worried about everything. Don't worry. What goes down must eventually come up. That's just the way life is. We are in this roller coaster of life. Just enjoy that ride. Be part of it. Embrace it. Whatever it is. I had to figure out a new way of teaching. I did it. I'm going to have to figure out a new way of seeing my patients. I'm doing it. 
we're wearing our protection, we're doing all things, but there's no reason to hide in your caves anymore. Get out there, be part of the society, be part of it. It's, it's a great day. Just keep positive and everything is going to go up. So thank you so much, Thomas. I enjoyed it tremendously.